State Research Institute at Kyoto University and a pioneer in the field of zoopharmacognosy. Mike has in the past served as an adjunct faculty at the National Institute of Advanced Studies at the Indian Institute of Science campus and has been the director at Research the Institute at the at Kyoto University. University and a pioneer in the field of zoopharmacognosy. Mike has in the past served as an... Sorry about the delay. Um, uh, he has been an adjunct professor at the Center for Human Evolution Modeling Research at PRI and has been a visiting lecturer at Hiroshima City University in ecological anthropology and primatology. Mike is responsible for a bulk of the research and publications on self-medication in primates and has played a critical role in defining and shaping the field. Mike has worked over the years with a number of primate species, including but not limited to chimpanzees at Mahale, Japanese macaques, and langurs. Mike is joining us today all the way from Japan. And again, we're very excited to have you. So for those of you joining Primate Conversations for the first time, the way this is going to work is that Mike is gonna give his talk and then we will take some of your questions which you can leave in the live comment section of the YouTube page. Um, and with that, I'd like to hand things over to Mike. If you'd like to begin sharing your screen, I will now mute myself and we can get started. Okay, thank you very much. Oops, now it's gone all the way back. We'll hold on just a second. I'd like to thank all of you for attending today. It's really a, a pleasure for me to be able to, to give this talk to you all. And um, in, in, in these days of, of COVID where international travel is very difficult, things like Zoom and these scheduled meetings are very nice to keep people together, keep us all in contact and give us opportunities to, to discuss things in, 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 in spite of all the travel restrictions. Um, so without further ado, again, thanks for attending. And um, I'd like to talk today about the evolution of self-medication um, in animals with particular reference to the order of primates. And what you can see on the screen right now are um, six different species of several that I've worked with um, up, up until now. And all of these species you see here on the screen are ones that I've worked with colleagues um, on, on the topic of self-medication. Not all of the species we've looked at with, with animal self-medication, but some of the, the more recent ones that we've written things up about. Okay, so the first thing um, when we talk about self-medication in animals is where did it all start? And it actually started with self-medication in plants or plants using secondary plant metabolites to defend themselves from predators, whether they're insects or large herbivores. Um, plants have developed strategies to protect themselves to, to ward off those types of, of dangers to, their, um, to themselves. And there's two basic strategies against herbivores. One is the production of secondary compounds. And the other one is, is the production of physical barriers. This picture you see on your right um, is a scanning electron microscopic photo of a plant called Lipia plicata. And um, it's one of the, the, the leaves that the chimpanzees at Mahale fold and swallow but you can see these, these fine trichomes, these hairs made of silica. And silica is, is a product, is very, a substance that's very difficult to digest. So putting all of these leaves on the surface, all of these trichomes on the surface of your leaves makes it difficult for small insects to get in there and, and damage the leaves. But it also um, in, in induces a response in the intestinal tract that makes it difficult to, to digest. So it, it produces kind of like an upset stomach and the animals are supposedly not supposed to ingest too many of, of the leaves, which would damage the, um, the plant. But as we'll talk about today, a number of different animals, well, all the animal species that we've looked at so far seem to actually benefit from these two different um, strategies to help themselves ward off uh, parasites basically either with, with well, it also, also another 
number of other different things that they're, they're active against. But much of what I'll be talking about today are the anti-parasitic strategies of animals. Um, and also probably the first self-medicators, at least from the evidence that we have currently, are insects. So this is not necessarily a, a strategy, a, a behavioral strategy that involves a lot of cognitive process. At least it doesn't have to involve cognitive process. But animals that are good social learners that do have higher social learning capacity rely on um, social learning transmission of information be, between individuals as well as individual learning. So it's not all instinctual, but I'll, I'll get into more of that later on. And I'm sure there'll be some questions related to that. But for starters, just to give you an idea of, of how early this, this association be, between animals and plants is, it, it goes back to the insects. And we have examples of, of insects that have a very specific relationship with particular plant species where the plant benefits from the animal and the animal benefits from the secondary compounds produced by that plant for a number of different um, purposes. Some are to simply make oneself taste bad, make themselves taste bitter by sequestering and storing the secondary compounds in, in little um, containers with, within their body. So that if an animal, a, a bird, for example, tries to peck on a caterpillar, it will get this, this bad tasting substance and will uh, avoid trying to prey on that insect the next time. Um, also, if they're, if they're parasitized by insects with inside, by parasites with inside their body, they can ingest these secondary compounds of some quite toxic plants and inhibit or suppress the growth and development of these parasites or sometimes actually killing the par parasites themselves. So very similar properties starting with the insects all the way up to the apes and to humans. So what is animal self-medication? Basically, from my perspective, it's a behavioral strategy by which animals avoid or suppress disease transmission. They can treat or control the symptoms or um, directly treat the agents of that that are causing the illness. Um, thereby directly or indirectly enhancing health and reproductive fitness. That's why this behavior is so important, so adaptive, and probably why we see it from the insects all the way on. And I'll argue that every living species on the planet today self-medicates in one way or another. We just have to go out there and, and log up the different species and, and, and see how each species differs. And that's how I've spent a lot of my, my time over, over the last 25, 30 years that I've been interested in animal self-medication is looking at the variation across species. Today, because of time restraints, I'll probably only be able to talk most about the primates, but there's a lot of really cool information out there about other species that show a lot of interesting similarities. So my main goal for studying self-medication has been to understand, one, the potential health threats to animals in nature, what makes them sick that makes them want to or, or need to self-medicate, how do they respond to these threats? How effective are the behaviors that they have to re respond to these threats? Um, how is the information maintained within a population? Is it socially transmitted? Is it innate? Is, 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 a, is, is it a combination of these different things? That's one of the big, big questions that I have when I'm, I'm looking at, at this topic. And also, traditionally, it, it turns out humans um, as, as a species have long looked to other species, whether they're hunter-gatherers looking at the animals in the forest that they hunt or that, that they, they, they share similar um, life strategies, other carnivores, for example. They're very curious about the behavior of those animals and they've learned over time that animals also self-medicate. So this type of information, the transfer of information, knowledge from animals to humans about medicinal plants has been going on for a long, long time. We even have um, interesting information from the Neanderthals that suggests that they're using similar plants that other animal species were using to treat similar um, diseases. So this is something that has been going on for a long time. Um, currently, we, we have four different modes by which animals have been demonstrated to self-medicate. And, this, and these, these modes are inclusive across the animal kingdom. Um, mode one, which I won't go in, into much detail, I won't 
go into any detail today. Basically, it's just the optimal avoidance or reduction of the possibility for disease transmission. That's what all of us are doing when we step out of our out of our houses today with, with masks. We keep social distance. We have a mask to prevent the transmission of, of the germs we may have or to cut down on, on the possible um, inhaling of, of, of the, the, the virus or whatnot. But animals have similar ways of avoiding disease transmission. Um, I, I won't go into much detail about that today. Mode two is what I call passive prevention. It's the dietary selection of items with an added preventative substance that um, aids in health maintenance. Um, it, can, it, it can do things like it in, in, in induce immune response or indirectly or, or directly in a very low level, um, make it difficult for bacteria, uh, other types of pathogens to settle into the, to the body and, and transmit it in, in, into a full blown infection. And there's mode three, which is actually when you get sick, if you're un unfortunate enough to get parasitized or have a stomach upset from a, a bacterial infection or something, um, then there's specific direct treatments like humans would take an aspirin for a headache um, or a fever. Animals use some plants specifically to treat a specific symptom. And that response the, the curative response is, is, is rather quick so that they can learn to associate between the ingestion of these substances and actual relief. Um, in, in the cases that we know so far is as little as, as almost instantaneously for the, the case of geophagy, ingesting clay that has an absorptive property. It's like an, an antacid, it will absorb the agents that are causing this discomfort in your stomach to something that can actually take up to 24 hours, like leaf swallowing is six hours but um, bitter pith chewing usually about 24 hours. So they can, they, they can an, an anticipate this change in, in um, their health with the ingestion of these different substances over different periods of time. But it's a direct treatment to a specific symptom and often to a specific pathology. Whether they understand that, that pathology or not is a completely different question and, and probably most animals don't. Um, but that Therapeutic treatment is something that we, we share with the other animals. And then there's something else, mode four, called fumigation. It, it can be the application of substances to the body or to the burrow where you live. In, in the case of great apes, in, in, into a sleeping nest at night. It's, it's been documented that, that some plants with these aromatic um, substances actually may be helping to ward off um, mosquitoes and other biting insects that can transmit disease. But a, a number of other bird and mammal species who live in nests or in, in burrows have also been documented to have this same um, habit. So we'll be talking basically about these lower three modes, two, three, and four in the talk today. Um, starting off with mode two, I've called this medicinal foods based on the cultural and anthropological literature, the ethno-medicinal literature. It's, it's, it's a concept in humans, wide, widespread. And I, I put up one saying from um, Japanese. It's also shared in Chinese, yakushoku dogen, Medis medicine and food are of the same origin. And in many diet, um, dietary cultures, there are, are actually certain treatments for things like the flu which involve cooking up a chicken with a bunch of different herbs and things. So it's, it's food, but it's also got these other things that, that boost your immune system, that suppress bacterial infection, things like that. So it, it has both a food and a medicinal value. And I'll show you how that works in um, primates in just a second. Um, how I first got onto this idea about medicinal foods was actually after I started looking at mode three, self-medication self or the direct therapeutic treatment to try and find other plants in the, in the chimpanzee diet at Mahale that may have these medicinal properties that I could look at next to try and understand more about what, what plants they're taking to, to um, treat themselves, to make themselves um, healthier. 
So what I did was to take the plant food list of, of the Mahale chimpanzees. At that time, there was 172 species. And I went through the ethno-medicinal literature of Africa, specifying only those plants that are used to treat parasite infections or gastrointestinal upsets, symptoms that could be related to parasite infection, because that's the direction that the, the evidence that I was gathering was pointing to, that the chimpanzees, when suffering from parasite infections, were, were finding treatments, ways to control the, the discomfort from the infection, and sometimes actually to kill or expel the parasites. But I, I wanted to see if there's other species out there in their diet. So when I, when I, I looked to the ethno-medicinal um, database, then I found that 22% of the plant species, the specific plant part that the chimps were eating, were also used in Africa by people to treat parasites and gastrointestinal upsets. As most of you know, chimpanzees are highly frugivorous. They're the optimal uh, omnivore. They, they hunt, they eat meat, all, kind, all kinds of different things they include in their diet. But there have to be figs or some kind of fruit in the habitat if you're going, if you're going to find chimpanzees. So they do rely a lot on fruit. But if you look at the medicinal foods in their diet, the majority are leaves and stems, things that aren't associated with these, these foods that are high in, in protein or sugars, um, carbohydrates, things like that, a little bit off, off, off the beaten path of, of what they're normally eating, followed by bark and seeds and 5% were actually fruit, but they're not quite what we, th we, we think are, are the kinds of fruit that we see in these pictures here. They're very, usually very small, seedy type things. So that's kind of um, misrepresentative. They're not actually the big, big sweet fruits, but they're still classified botanically as fruits. So that got me started with this concept about medicinal foods. And I've been looking at a number of different primate species to try and see how this pattern is repeated across primates. So the next target that I, I had was the Japanese macaque. I've been studying them for close to the last 40 years here in Japan. And to start with, um, a, a former graduate student of mine, Andrew McIntosh and I, got together two, two databases. One was the parasites of 10 different populations across the Japanese archipelago. And that's what you see here on this, on this map. And those sites conveniently range from a very high, very northerly, highly temperate, um, almost subarctic um, location and the, the, the tip of Honshu, the northernmost distribution of all primates in the world on Shimokita Peninsula, all the way down to the island of Yakushima, which is semi-tropical. So you have a lot of different types of habitats, a lot of different plants you can be selecting for in your diet, but also from this database on the parasite infections of each troop, we can see there's a very interesting trend. The, the, the warmer the climate gets, the more amicable it is to parasite infection, and the more parasite species that a population of, of Japanese monkeys is actually being infected by. So this list is flipped up upside down. So you're looking from the south down to the north here, and you can see that there's a difference in the number of parasite species that any one of these populations are actually burdened by. So using that as a possible um, stimulus for selecting plants in the diet with anti-parasitic properties, we went through the plant diet list and we looked at the properties based on um, Asian ethno medicinal uses, as well as, as, as full-scale pharmacological studies on these different plants. And overall, about 11.9% of the plants in the diet of all of these um, locations combined was about 12%, a little bit less than what we see with the chimpanzees. Um, as suspected, 78% of, of the plants that they're consuming have no reported medicinal properties. Another in interesting thing we, we, we came up with was, well, a, a lot of plants have secondary compounds to protect themselves. So we would expect some kind of, of um, medicinal property to come out there. And some people have argued that all plants in the forest are medicinal. How, how do you know these animals are selecting? one from the other. So this is some really interesting data to try and, and get at that question. 10% of the, of the 
another 10% of the plants in the diet had no medicinal properties or had other medicinal properties, but not anti-parasitic properties. And when we did a, a very simple correlation between the number of parasite species in, in a population and the number of plants with anti-parasitic properties in their diet, got a very strong correlation. But when we looked at the other medicinal properties, the, the number of species with other properties and the number of parasites in their, that they're infected by, there is absolutely no um, correlation. So it, it's suggestive that, they're, that their Japanese macaque diet is actually being driven in the selection of plants with anti-parasitic properties according to the number of parasites they're actually infected with. So we've run with this idea and, and are looking at a lot of other different species to try and see if we have similar um, traits coming up. And this is just a, a brief summary of the different types of properties that we found from that, that first study published in 2010. And you can see a lot of different properties have been demonstrated in the laboratory. Um, and antibacterial, antilimentic, antiviral, activities against ectoparasites, antifungal, antiprotozoan, that's blood parasites. Um, so a lot of activity in those, in that small proportion of plants in the diet. We, we did another study just on Yakushima, looking at a new database from a different population. And we looked specifically at some of the properties against some very important parasites in tropical countries. Trypanosoma, which is sleeping sickness, Plasmodia falsiparum, which is malaria, and Leishmania donovani, it's another parasitic disease, very um, severe, um, very important economically because so many people are infected by it in, in certain parts of the world. And um, a large percent, over 80% of, of the plants that we had selected that had some something to suggest to us that it was potentially being used medicinally by, by the Japanese macaques on Yakushima, 80% of those inhibited growth of Plasmodia falsiparum and Lismania donovani, these two very important parasite infections. Um, another study we, we did with the gorillas, um, the lowland gorillas and mountain gorillas. Um, we looked at all the published data at that time. This was published in 2002. So all, all of the reports on the diet of lowland and mountain gorillas at that time we went to and looked at, at the um, ethno-medicinal properties of the diet. And we came up with a number of different interesting properties that have given us some, some ideas where to go next with, with studies with, with, with the gorilla. But they include things like stimulants, like a very strong cup of coffee. They're ingesting um, cola nuts that have very, very high caffeine content. Also things that have cardiotonic properties. If you're thinking about mountain gorillas that are climbing up to great heights to get food or just just to be up there for who knows why, they're taking some of these plants in those areas or on their way to those areas, suggesting that, that that's a way that they're getting um, boosted up to make, to make that climb. Um, some other properties that are also tightly associated with antiparasitic properties are also tumor growth inhibitors and bacterial sites, fungicides. There seems to be some kind of overlap in a lot of plants around the world that have these these combinations of, of medicinal properties. We also did a study with the woolly spider monkeys in Brazil, close to Sao Paulo. Um, and we had 84 different plant items. And again, from that, 24.5% of those species were used locally by human residents as medicine. Five, another five, well, part of those five, part of that five, from that 35 species um, were used as laxatives and purgatives, which also has an antiparasitic property. Um, and another five species specifically had antiparasitic activities reported from the Amazonian ethno-medicinal literature. So again, we see this pattern building up in all the species that we've looked at. So now we're gonna jump to mode three um, and therapeutic treatment. And there's, there's another saying, of course, in Japanese, yo yaku wa kuchi ni nigashi. Good medicine is bitter to the taste. And so many of these plant secondary compounds are made bitter, or not made bitter, but they are bitter, and that has an anti herbivory um, mechanism to it. Animals, when, when they don't find something that, 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 that tastes good to the palate, then they'll reject it. And bitter is one of the strongest evolutionary signals of poison. 
but um, it, what, what has been passed passed down through human history from 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 the the ancient Greek society as well, and, and probably further further back than that. Bitter things, well, poison in small amounts is medicine. So there's this this interesting balance in going on here with bitter things and humans around the world have come to recognize that bitter tasting things have certain properties and they tend to be medicinal, whether it's to stimulate appetite, to lower fever or as an antiparasitic. So it's a reliable cue, both as a poison, something to avoid, but also something you can take if you're careful in small enough amounts and the animal kingdom outside of humans seem to have come to the same conclusion. So I'll talk briefly about the first plant that got me involved in self-medication back in 1987. Um, totally random incident happened one day. I wasn't, I wasn't at Mahali to study self-medication actually at all, but it was two days of observation in 1987 on a sick chimpanzee called Chaoshiku that really changed my world and redirected part of, of a major part of my um, research interest for the last 30 years or so. Um, and it's a real interesting relationship between chimpanzees, a plant, Renonia amygdalina, which is also widely used across Africa as a medicinal plant by humans, and this nasty parasite, actually very beautiful looking parasite if you, if you like parasites, um, Esophagostomum stephanostomum. You can see, again, a scanning electron microscopic picture of, of the mouth part of that parasite. And it's got this really pretty rosette pattern. I think there's 33 um, leaves around the mouth parts there that, that signify that that is esophagostomum stephanostomum. So at that point, the parasite was known, but this life history wasn't really understood. So part of what, what I was doing back in the, in the first two or three years of this research was to try and understand the host parasite ecology. What makes them sick? So we had to had to figure out what parasites, if parasites were, were the problem, and what parasite was affected and what parasites were not affected by the different treatments that we were watching them use. And it narrowed down nicely to esophagostomum, stephanostomum. And we found this, this same parasite to be targeted both by bitter pith chewing with, with um, Venonia amygdalina and with leaf swallowing, which I'll explain in the next series of slides here. But it all started out from two, two days observation where just basic um, activity budgets compared with controlled individuals who, who didn't seem to be sick at the same time of year and the same hours of the day. And we were able to show very distinct differences in the behavior that would suggest one, that the animal had no appetite in the very beginning, that Chaosku had no appetite in the beginning. She couldn't, she didn't have the strength to travel for very long distances at time. And when she could travel, it was in, in short spurts of maybe one to two meters sitting down and resting. That's intermittent rest. That's how I, I defined that activity and differentiated it from other types of movement. But over the 24 hour period, you can see if you closely follow these figures that her appetite drastically improved. She spent 80% of her time in the afternoon of the second day feeding um, she spent a lot of time in a day bed, the, the, the first day and the next, the next morning and early, early morning, um, compared to other individuals who spent very little time in, 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 in beds during the daytime and, and only a certain time up to, up to very early morning. But we, we can see big differences in how these, these chimpanzees are behaving when they're sick and when they're visibly healthy looking. So that's how it got started. But as I said, we had to find out what the parasites what made them sick and parasites seem to be the most obvious um, um, element to start looking at. So we, we did um, this host parasite ecology work for a number of years to try and understand the, the reinfection patterns of chimpanzees with this parasite and correlate that with their self-medicative behaviors. So in 1991, had another example, another female, Fatuma. She was sick, showing the same kinds of symptoms had diarrhea, we, but by, by this time we were collecting fecal samples regularly from all the animals. We were taking, we were making health health charts, so we knew when an animal was um, apparently behaving healthy and when it wasn't, when it had no appetite, when it was spending a lot of time sleeping. All those kinds of different measures that we could try and e evaluate um, what 
what a healthy individual is, what a not healthy individual is, what the same individual is when it's healthy and when it's not, and to be able to measure the change between sickness and health in sp specific individuals and link that to the possible consumption of, of different plants. So we were also doing plant chemistry. We were measuring the uh, amount of the, the most bioactive compounds in a, in a specific measure of pith that the chimpanzees would consume. So we could compare the, the dosage of a chimpanzee and humans in, in the same forest. The Watongwe also used this plant as a treatment for the very same symptoms. And we, we found out, I, I found out from, from talking with, with my um, local collaborators who were um, traditional healers, that when you take a dose of um, Vernonia amygdalina um, leaf juice, very, very bitter, just as bitter as the pith, that within about 20, 24 hours, you begin to feel better. So we were seeing again, this very interesting similarity between the chimpanzees and the humans, a similar dose, and a similar recovery period. And the Watong, we are also using this plant to treat parasites. They can take a couple of leaves, squash them, and drink the juice as a treatment for malaria. And it seems to be as effective as um, over-the-counter anti-malarials. And we, we've done work, uh, which I'll talk a little bit about um, later, that actually demonstrate that anti-malarial properties as well. So, as I mentioned, we, we, were, we were also starting to look at the plant secondary compounds in this plant. When we first started off, it was, it was obvious that Vernonia amygdalina was widely used across Africa. A lot of research had been done on it because it was a medicinal plant for humans. Um, one, of the most, um, one of the most highly researched treatments of that, with that plant is diabetes. So there's been a lot of demonstration showing um, very rapid lowering of blood sugar levels, but also a lot of work with anti-cancer properties and anti-parasitic properties. We were probably the second group to demonstrate the anti-cancer properties. So when I took the plants back to Japan and gave them to my um, new colleagues um, to try and, and, and understand what was in, in, in the plant that could have been active against parasites or whatever was making them sick, they did a, a, a basic screening of, of compounds in the leaves, in the bark, and in the pith that the chimpanzees were using. Up to that point, over 70 years of, of research history on this plant, no one had looked at the pith, but everyone had been looking at the leaves because that's what the humans can most easily get a hold of year round. And um, so it, it, everyone was looking at the leaves and a lot of sesquiterpen lactones were reported from that with very active properties, some actually toxic, but no one had looked at the pith. So a whole new class of compounds, steroid glucosides, we discovered 13 of them had been unknown to phytochemists after even that long period of, of, of research on it. So we were happy to find these new compounds and we began to investigate their properties against parasites and other ailments that would be of, of um, benefit to treat in humans as well. So we got started with that and things were looking really nice. We thought we had an understanding about what the chimps were doing with Renonia. And I decided to revisit the idea of leaf swallowing. It had first been observed by Jane Goodall at Gombe back in the 60s. And then Richard Wrangham briefly talked about it in his PhD thesis published in the 70s. And it was in the 80s early 80s, I think 1983, when Rangam and Nishida published a paper on leaf swallowing. They didn't quite know what it was all about, but they said it wasn't nutritional. So that's where they, they, get, they got their interest because they would fold and swallow the leaves. And you can see this chimpanzee here in the picture very, very carefully, one leaf at a time, clipping it off close to the, the, um, the stem there, and then folding and swallowing it. And Basically, what, 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 what the researchers up to this point were seeing was the chimpanzees exhibiting this behavior. And then later from, from, from secondary data collected, they were finding these leaves again, whole in the feces, undigested and unchewed. So they thought something really weird is going on, but it wasn't really clear what was going on. So when I started this work, I immediately tried to see if there was a connection with parasites. So I was looking at the, the leaf swallowing event, and I was following the anim animals, and I was looking for the feces the next day, and I was finding whole worms in the feces. So that 
first got me um, um, focused again with leaf swallowing and the expulsion of parasites. And again, it was this esophagostomum stephanostomum that was, was, was being targeted, not only with Renonia bitter pits, but now also with, with a number of different species of leaves being folded and swallowed. And if you look at that picture on the bottom, you'll see an adult esophagostomum worm. Normally, two leaves on average is enough swallowed to expel one adult worm. And we've seen up to 55 leaves being swallowed in one sitting. So 55 leaves, that's, that's a little bit over 25 adult parasite worms being expelled. And when they do that, what time of year and what the relationship is to the reinfection of esophagostum was the key to our understanding about this therapeutic treatment. So here we have the medicinal foods and the self-medication separated by colors. And on, on your right side, this is two different years of um, data of esophagostomum reinfection patterns. And these, these lines are, each, each line is a different individual that I followed throughout this time period. And as you get to these peaks, that's when the number of adult worms in the host has begun to take a sharp rise. What this is measuring is the eggs per gram of feces, but we know that esophagostomum lays eggs at a fairly fixed, reliable rate. So we can pretty much judge, relatively speaking, the parasite load of esophagostomum. And we can see that roughly one month into the onset of the rainy season, regardless of when the rains actually begin to fall, that the, we see these rises. And that's the time during this, this period of, of reinfection is the time when we see medicinal foods and self-medication happening. But it's not that everyone is doing this at the same time. Specific individuals when showing symptoms of, of weakness, of, of, of sickness, it's those individuals that use these two methods. And very rarely do you see a whole group come upon a plant and feed together like they were eating some other um, type of food. So it's very, very situation specific. That's why I refer to it as therapeutic treatment. Um, and over time, I began to talk to colleagues at different sites and I, I worked at other sites as well, worked at Budongo and also at, at the Gombe Stream for some time. Um, and the, the number of plant species being folded and swallowed rapidly increased as the, as, as the number of different people I talked to increased. And that to, to this date, around 40 different plant species now are being folded and swallowed by chimpanzees, bonobos, and lowland gorillas, eastern and western, but not mountain gorillas, just, just the lowland gorillas, across 18 different sites and in close to 28 different groups within those sites. So it's a very widespread behavior all across Africa. And probably if someone were to set up a new site today, they would find leaf swallowing. But the, the question is what species would they be expelling and what plant species would they be using? because we see different patterns across the country according to the climatic um, structure of the habitat, which in encourages different parasite species to in infect the host more than others. So the, the, the parasite and, and, and the host relationship is variable and it fluctuates according to the seasonality of a research site. But the fact that all these species are folding and swallowing leaves and they're expelling one of two or three different parasites is constant. Um, and we even see it in Asian primates. This is a, 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 a paper that I, I, I collaborated with on with a, um, an it, Italian colleague, Claudia, and she worked in Thailand. And we see here that the um, white-handed gibbon is also selecting these rough leaves with the long um, silica hairs and folding and swallowing, but they're expelling another parasite, Streptophagus pigmentatus. And this parasite species is also being expelled by Japanese macaques, sometimes with leaf swallowing down on the island of, of Yakushima. There's not a lot of work on that yet, but there, is, there's, there are observations that, that have demonstrated that folding and swallowing of leaves and expelling the same parasite is happening in Japanese macaques. But probably because of the, the, the large range of climatic um, Variation is probably only a few few places where chimp, where the Japanese macaque would need to actually fold and swallow leaves. But Yakushima seems to be the place to look at in more detail if you want to figure this out. 
Um, and also we, I, I've collaborated with, with colleagues in, in Taiwan and looking at the Chinese lesser civet. They're also folding and swallowing a very tough um, sp spiny grass and they're expelling another parasite, Toxicara paradoxura, which is common to um, carnivores. So even outside of the primates, we're seeing this, this type of behavior. And the leaf swallowing, I don't have time to go into it today, but leaf swallowing is actually probably one of the best and most widely demonstrated anti-parasitic behaviors in animals today, ranging from birds all the way up through a number of different mammal species. And mode four, this non-ingestive self-medicated behavior where a, 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 an animal will actually chew on a leaf substance or rub it to, to break the, the um, cells in the leaf or, or the fruit, and then they'll rub that on their body or sometimes they'll rub it on the body of their um, group mates. We have a number of different examples. We can see a lot of examples from um, Central and South America, some from Madagascar as well, but either using plants or using um, ants or millipedes, which are exuding this this de de um, a defensive acid that animals are actually using to their advantage in the same way that they're using these plant secondary compounds to help ward off um, biting insects. That's, that's the, the, the current major hypothesis for what's going on with this. But we have a lot of evidence in a number of different species, even the coati, a, a South American, a small South American mammal, and the brown bear found across um, North America and Eurasia, the same habit of chewing on plant. Usually it, it's, it's the, 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 the roots of plant for the bear, and for the coati, it's the sap from the bark, but they'll rub this on their body in the same way that we're seeing a number of primate species um, deal with. And here's another example from Asia with the um, orangutan. And there's two papers on this by the, by, by the same group. But what they found here um, is that it seems most likely that the, the orangutan, like the humans in this area, are using the plant as an anti-inflammatory agent to, to help pain in swollen joints. And they've actually done the, the phytochemistry of this species and demonstrated that it has very, very um, active anti-inflammatory properties that would relieve the, the pain. And that's substantiated by how the local people use this, this plant. So this is another interesting example of a variation from what we're seeing with the neotropical primates and with um, mammals in North America, but the, the, a similar type of application with a different function. Um, and just briefly, this is, this is about as, as much as I'll talk about other species, but there's a, a number of different examples of animals that have a nest or burrow down and, and raise their young in fixed locations for a long period of time. You're bound to get all kinds of nasty things building up just because you're, you're staying there and you're bringing food in and, and everything. So bacterial infections can rise. You can have um, ectoparasites, mites, ticks, m mosquitoes and things that will, will come and, and get your blood in exchange. They'll, they'll, they'll give you some disease that you really don't want to, uh, to have. But we have examples of fruit bats in southern India, um, chimpanzees and orangutan again, with birds lining their nests with um, cigarette butts packed full of um, nic nicotine, which is one of the world's oldest anti-parasitic properties used by humans. The wood rat and um, raptor species, and of course ants, probably one of the earliest um, producers and users of antibiotics. Humans have still been are still unable to reproduce this, to, to synthesize this antibiotic, but it's one of the strongest antibiotics that, that we know. Um, and now briefly to, to finish this talk, I think getting close to the time here. Um, there's, as, as I mentioned earlier, there's this important link between traditional living people, and their traditional ecological knowledge about the environment, the plants and the animals, and that potential for us to find and develop new medicines from old treatments. Um, and this is um, Moshi Bunengwa. He was a long-term friend and, and um, tracker at, at Mahale. And he was also 
in his family, there are traditional healers. And one of his cousins was my very close collaborator through over 20 years of work at Mahale. Mohammed Isaif Karunde was also a traditional healer and um, very knowledgeable in the animals of the, of, of the forest, into the plants, everything. Right? So he's the perfect collaborator to have. But again, we didn't start out collaborating to look at self-medication. We were looking at something else, but it became obvious his vast knowledge of, 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 of the area, the plants and the animals, that he was, was the person that I needed to work with if I could learn more about the animals and the plants. So those connections, here's Mohammedi in the upper right hand corner. He's demonstrating how to prepare the root of this plant, Mulengalele, it's, it's a member of the acacia family. Um, and his grandfather discovered its use as an antibiotic from watching the behavior of crested porcupines. Um, so all, all kinds of different species have something to, to teach us. And closing off just again, traditional healers have long inquired, acquired important medicines by observing the self-medicative behavior of animals. Scientists in the last 30 years thought we were we were discovering new, new things and, and pushing the edge of science, but we're actually rediscovering what traditional living people had known for a long, long time. Um, this is just an example of some of the interesting applications for Vernonia amygdalina. I, I won't go into all of them, but this is just a, a, a brief summary of all the different types of activities that have been mentioned within ethno-medicinal use of Africa. So there's a lot going on in, in that plant. It has a lot of different physiological activities. Um, some of our, our work within the group, we looked at the antischistosomal activity of the sesquiterpen lactones, antitumoral, antimicrobial activities. Um, there was a, a patent to come out later on from Jackson State University in Missouri actual patent for the application of a water extract from the, the, the leaves of Vernonia amygdalina, and they cite our work within that um, patent application for the anti-tumoral activity that we, we discovered. And it's, it's a patent to use this as a treatment for breast cancer. And some years later, a group in Malaysia also looked at these compounds and also not, not, not only based on, on our work, but based on, on, on the traditional um, pharmacopoeia of Africa and of, of India, they realized that it was being used by a lot of different people for the treatment of, 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 of cancers. And here they were actually to able to demonstrate the mode of action and what these compounds are actually doing are flipping off a switch of a mutant gene that makes women more susceptible to breast cancer. So they've actually got it to the molecular, the genetic level to show the, the mechanisms of these compounds. So this is really exciting stuff. And if this is what we found from one species, imagine what can come out of all the other plants that animals are, are using for various reasons. Um, I'll close here and want to thank all of my um, non-human species teachers who have helped in this process to understand self-medication. And we, we truly stand on the shoulders of giants, large and small humans and, and animals. So we have a lot to learn about where to go from here by looking back into the history of the evolution of, of animals. And primates have played a big role in all of that. Thanks a lot for your attention. I hope it was um, interesting for you. Um, thank you so much, Mike, for that great talk. Um, very interesting. And now we have some questions from the audience from our YouTube page. Um, also, if audience members have more questions as these questions are asked, feel free to put them in the chat and um, we'll try to get to as many as we can. So to begin with, um, has anyone investigated if human self-medication may have started from interspecies transmission of information? For example, humans learning from observing other animals. Yes, as the, that, that question probably came early on, but I'm, I'm writing a, 
review paper right now, and virtually every continent, all, all of these very, very old human traditions, um, there are examples of medicine that are ascribed to have been learned from watching the behavior of animals. Um, in some cases, they'll, they'll call it like bear medicine. It was given to them by the bear spirit, but it's 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 a um, a, a an expression within that culture that doesn't necessarily mean they got it from a spirit, but most of the cases actually from from watching the behavior of animals who have a very high cultural significance within their societies. So they're very focused on what that species does. So there's a many many cases of of, of humans obtaining new medicines from watching animals. And this has been going on, again, as I mentioned earlier, from before we were even homo sapiens. It's probably been going on for a much longer time. There's no evidence, however, of the animals, for example, the animals that I've been studying, learning from other species. We know that they'll observe each other. Young will observe the behavior of their mothers. And that's how they get started in, in the selection of plants and how plants are ingested in, in, in a particular way. But there's no evidence so far of interspecies learning other than humans versus other species. With the opposite direction, is it hasn't been looked into. Maybe it's happening, but don't know. Thank you. Um, and I know this next question you, you addressed as well, as you named a number of species of primates um, that self-medicate. But would you predict that self-medication is a universal across the primate order? Um, it's universal. Go ahead. With, with variants across different populations. Definitely, we, we're seeing variants across populations in the plants selected, um, and also because of, of the, the difference in seasonality and habitat differences. They have different pathogens or more or less pressure from those pathogens. So you'll have variation in the frequency that a behavior is exhibited. And we have a lot of evidence with that for leaf swallowing from several different populations now. Um, and there will be different strategies and different species on different continents probably, but I guarantee every living species on the planet, forget primates, everything is self-medicating. They're, they're, they're all, we, all, we all get sick, no matter what our species are, we all get sick and there's, there's, there has to be ways to ameliorate those, if, effects as, as, a, as a basic survival strategy. So I, I'll, I'll, I'll bet a month's paycheck, but it'll take longer than, than our lives to figure that out. But every animal on the species self-medicates. It's just too important not to do. Great. Um, so our next question is, we often see manga bays frantically eating mushrooms and certain caterpillars. Um, do primates eat items for hallucinogenic properties? I have never seen it, and a prim no primatologist has ever written about it, but there is one example, a very nice example, of um, gorillas, porcupines, and bush pigs, all digging up and chewing on the roots of Tabernanthi iboga. This is a plant, it's probably more widely distributed in Africa, but in, in Central Africa is where these observations were made. Um, by the hunter-gatherers, the Mbuti or Mbaka um, peoples. And they pass that information on to agriculturalists. I forget the name of, of, of the ethnic group, but they use that plant now in their cultural ceremonies to converse with the spirits. And what, what the hunt, hunter-gatherers report is that animals will chew on this root and they'll run around like, like, like they're being attacked by something, but the, the human watches that and there's nothing around. So scientists from several different countries have actually taken that plant and fed it to dogs, to chickens, to cats, and they've demonstrated that these animals will also hallucinate. So we, we know that, that, that some populations do this of, of primates. It, it's, it's fairly widely known that reindeer with magic mushrooms, um, elephants with um, amarula, baboons, you know, all kinds of different examples of in ingesting fermented fruits are going on. So it's one, one way or another, they're, they're experiencing something. Why they're doing that, I don't know. Um, but alcohol 
ethanol is known as a very, um, very significant antiparasitic agent. Um, so caterpillars, Drosophila will in ingest certain amounts of, of ethanol and that controls parasites from um, parasitoid wasps. Um, but whether that, I don't think they do it recreationally. I any of these species do it, do it like humans have somehow figured out to do. But that's an interesting topic. It's, it's another one that I'm, I'm, I'm looking at, at, at the literature and, and trying to, to look at the evolutionary roots of, of this behavior. But um, yeah, some species do it, but no primate, no scientist has, has written a, a paper on it specifically. So it's an interesting topic for someone who's ready to try it. Um, great. So the next question was, was the decrease in the egg count accompanied by the presence of dead nematodes? And this begs the question whether the Vernonia was suppressing egg laying or actually killing the parasites. We have laboratory evidence that, that shows that it permanently paralyzes adult schistosomes. So we know that it has that, that paralyzing effect, which would, pr would prevent them from laying eggs. Um, from the observational information, the worms are coming out alive, very much alive, and, and they may have spent several, several days with those leaves that are being folded and, 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 and swallowed. So in that case, it seems to be a, a physical expulsion. But with Vernonia amygdalina, we don't really have evidence um, from, from the feces linked with, with, with that, except for the drop in eggs. But what we know from the laboratory suggests that it's, it's paralyzing the, 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 the parasites within the host, so their egg production is dropping or in combination with leaf swallowing, just a number of adults are, are being depleted. So that's, that, that, that combination of, of behaviors is, is what's driving this drop in, in eggs per gram. Awesome. And I, so I think we have time for one more question um, and it's kind of a big one, but we have about three minutes left. So um, uh, we are wondering how much of this is innate and how much is learned? That's the big question that I'm still trying to answer. I've done studies with captive chimpanzees to see how they, what they think of rough leaves that are being folded and swallowed by chimps in the wild. And um, we, our, our, our conclusion was that normally chimps that, that have never seen this plant before, that have no cultural context for its use, don't like it and they avoid it. But someone is able to reinvent that habit of, of leaf swallowing, folding it and everything. And that seems to be due to the um, properties of the leaf itself. It just makes it easier to get stuck in the mouth. And if, if you're playing around with it to be folded and what the heck, let's just swallow it kind of thing. But chimps in Mahale will chew the leaves for food when, when other items are scarce but when they have parasite infections and they'll fold and swallow. This is um, Ficus exasperata, it's a fig. And the leaves, are, the, the tree is called African sandpaper. Um, and we actually would, would, would use it to smooth the handles of our machetes. It's that rough. But um, so within the chimps, they, they, they differentiate how they use it. But things like bitter pith chewing, as well as leaf swallowing, the, in, in the beginning, part of it is socially learned. What, what plant you select, how you ingest that plant is, is, is definitely learned. But from our, our work in, in, in three different populations in captivity, we know that even naive chimps can begin to fold and swallow those leaves and that that will be socially transmitted to the, the, the detail as to what orientation, you, you take that leaf into your mouth to fold and swallow either sideways or this way. And we've shown that in individual populations, well, it, in the beginning, demonstrating both um, sideways and, and longwise, that the group will conform their behavior to one type. And that type is based on the dominant type displayed by the first individual who came up with the idea of, of folding and swallowing for the first time seeing those leaves. But with, with all of these different behaviors, there's probably innate road 
road posts that, that kind of guide an animal's senses. And there's probably feedback with, with, with um, internal state and a preference or a, a dislike for certain smells and tastes according to how they're feeling. So it, it, it's this balance between innate and, and, and learned mechanism, but that's probably different for each species to some extent. Um, some species may be more on the innate side, like um, caterpillars or hydrosophila. No one has looked at social learning in drosophila as far as I know, but there is social learning in insects. Um, so it's, it's still an open question. And I, and I, I, I don't want to say it's all innate or it's, you can't say it's all social learning because we already have evidence for, for, for both even in, in humans, for example. Um, but it, it's a good, great question. And it's, it's the, big, the big question that I want to try and answer part of anyway down, down the road, but it, it's, it's probably a combination. It will vary according to the species um, habit. Thank you so much, Mike, and thank you for taking the time. Um, and we appreciate it. Um, next week, uh, we'll have another talk at 4 p.m. on our channel, um, if you guys want to tune in.